Hi, uh, my name is Brad Smith, and uh, I'm a Bellingham guy. I've been here for 23 years. I was uh, the former dean at Huxley. That's where I came out here. In a former life, I was with EPA back in DC, and I moved here from EPA in DC, which sadly, I'm glad I'm not at EPA in DC right now. Uh, but I moved here from there to become dean at Huxley, and I was that for 18 years. And I retired, um, but I've also uh, been for six years, or seven, the chair of the Washington State Fish and Wildlife Commission. Um, so I divide my time between uh, here and Olympia, and uh, I'm happy to participate in, in this forum on urban wildlife or, yeah, in, in Bellingham. I live down Chuckanut, uh, down by the fire station there, so you can imagine I have my share of Bambies in the yard and other, other critters uh, all around. So urban wildlife. Um, and, and you guys know a lot about all this stuff, so I'm not going to go into any, you know, lecture of 101 on this, but we've always lived with wildlife in urban settings, uh, squirrels, pigeons, little, little moose mucopus and, and all those little critters, but, but it's changing, and it's changing for lots of reasons. Uh, cities are becoming greener, uh, more and more trees. Uh, cities are expanding into habitat that wasn't... Uh, traditionally urban, uh, the factors of climate change are, are factoring into this. So around the country, uh, urban wildlife and how we interact with urban wildlife is an increasingly uh, challenging problem. We all love critters. Uh, and in nature, as you know, more is not always better, it's just more. And we're a fa we are faced with more and more uh, all sorts of critters in, in urban settings. In the Lake Tahoe region, the number of bears has increased tenfold in 10 years. And a lot of those bears are gorging themselves on garbage and you know, picnic baskets like, like the old days. Uh, but but they're, they're in there and it's not, you know, in Griffith Park in LA, uh, collared cougars are being seen. Um, Alligators down in Florida, where when you push suburbs or, or areas out into the what what were what was uh, part of the Everglades ecosystem, you get alligators in the front yard and bath and in swimming pools and all of that. So it's it, it's getting more and more. Um, some cities have approached that in different ways. I mean, you know, some cities have brought in uh, trained uh, hunters, archers to. Uh, mostly archers, to, to reduce the population. Doesn't always meet with uh, you know, great, great popularity, but that is one mechanism. But one thing that I think those of us that are in the field and biologists understand, and those of us that also live with these critters, is that feeding them is not an answer. I think we always have a notion in our heart that it's a nice thing to do, let's feed them, or. I came from northern Michigan growing up, and people put out salt blocks in the woods, but that, you know, it was a little bit different. There, there weren't too many people around or neighborhoods, but more woods. Um, but feeding attracts more and more, and that leads to all sorts of things. You know, there's all sorts of diseases that are, are prevalent. We don't have chronic wasting disease yet in this state, but it's coming. You know, it's, it's shown up in Montana, and that's bad. We don't want to have that come here. Um, and and, and it's, it's in a lot of the Midwest and East, Eastern states. Uh, and also in the Eastern states, you have, you know, Lyme disease that's transmitted. And, and you have, in, in parts of the East, the tick population is incredible on, on, on big critters. So feeding is, is a challenge. And then you have with the smaller ones with rabies and all of it, but you know all of that. And I, I don't have to belabor that, that fact. What, what we are facing, though, is something that we need to do more research on this. Um, most wildlife research is based in wild lands, because that's where biologists like to spend their time. We haven't focused that much in urban research in terms of wildlife management. Though the Urban Wildlife Management Institute is doing a lot of stuff. Some cities are very progressive. Boulder has a very good program underway. So I think there's a lot of information out there that we can learn from and adapt and, and, and blend to our, uh, our neck of the woods here. Um, it is a problem, though, and it, and it is growing. I, I, I learned from Wendy the other day, I walk in the inner urban most days from the fire station down to Larrabee, 
And I've never seen coyotes there. I've seen coyotes in my backyard, but there was a coyote attack that, that Wendy mentioned that, you know, or stalking a dog there. Um, those inter encounters are going to come more, become more and more prevalent. So I think we want to be, be, do wildlife right. And I can tell you, wearing the fish and wildlife hat, our officers cannot come and some cities say sterilize the deer and that, that's, it's cost prohibitive, it, that can't work. We can't come, our officers are stretched pretty thin around the state and, and deal with individual actions all the time. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, not, it, it's not there. And also, this time of year we start seeing in the rehab centers, because we get the calls, people will bring in a fawn or other little, little young and say it was abandoned. Uh, so they, they turn up in, in the rehab centers where they run, run the real risk of being habituated. And that is not a good thing. We had an incident uh, in the state a couple months ago uh, where, where some uh, deer and, and one young elk had to be uh, put down. So when people think they're doing right by feeding, or think they're doing right by the critters by picking up a little fawn and they see in the backyard and taking it away into the rehab center, it's not the right thing to do. And I think we all know that. So sometimes we have to listen to this more than this, but in this, we all, all, all wanna do good. So what we're gonna hopefully work with uh, tonight with our ex experts is how we can use this in conjunction with this to do well by the critters that we all love. Uh, so with that, I'm, I'm going to be uh, emceeing the, the Q&A later and be happy to, to answer any questions. Um, those, uh, somebody has said, do I feed? And <clears throat> I feed a lot of things in my backyard. I feed hummingbirds and butterflies and bees. And a lot of people want to turn their backyard into a habitat that is, re you know, really receptive for, for critters of all size. And that can be done, and most of you know about this, but the National Wildlife Federation does an accreditation of backyards. So those, those of you that want to do right by, by nature, I would encourage, and you have even a very small backyard, you can have that become a prime habitat and get it certified by the National Wildlife Federation. And if you do that, they also throw in a membership and you get a nice sign to put in your backyard too. But, but there's criteria. And it, and it deals with all of the things, food, water, cover, places to raise young. <coughs> so we can feed wildlife in our backyards. Let's just keep it to the amphibians and the hummingbirds and the smaller critters. Because when they get bigger, it becomes more of a problem for everybody. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Mark. Thank you. Good evening and thanks for coming. I'm going to give a short presentation about the city's new ordinance, what's behind it, what the rationale is, and how we're dealing with uh, rolling it out into the community. And this is actually one of the first things we've done regarding the ordinance is to, to have this educational forum. We, as you'll see, we've got a, a website up that provides some resources. Um, we've developed a brochure, which is also out there. Uh, please make sure you gather any written materials you might be interested in on your way out. Um, and so I just want to provide that background. And then the, the real expert is uh, Cole Caldwell. He'll be following me. I'm just going to briefly talk about the, the, the rationale for the ordinance, uh, but try not to play biologist because I not uh, my information is broad, uh, but not very deep. So, uh, so I'm just going to give you the, the, the brief overview of how we develop this ordinance and why. Um, so uh, the, the first thing you note is we were, particularly in 2017, we're getting lots and lots and lots of calls about uh, problems with deer primarily, uh, including crowding, property destruction, conflicts with cars and domestic animals, uh, potential danger to people, deer charging people when they come out to get into their cars, et cetera. And, a number of the uh, people who wrote into the council attributed this to feeding. Uh, so the council uh, was hearing these concerns and asked me to do uh, some research and 
basically I did kind of a, a quick overview of the policy landscape, what other cities are doing, but also at least some of the uh, biological literature and, and things that relate to our knowledge about what issues do develop um, when uh, deer and other animals are fed. So the, the findings, just to summarize them, Briefly are that uh, deer are increasing in population in, in many urban areas in, in North America and in Europe. Um, deer reproduce very rapidly and if you give them lots of food, um, they will reproduce quite quickly and their numbers grow quickly. Um, and suburban developments plus green belts result in low-lying vegetation that can support higher populations than mature native forests. I found that kind of an interesting fact, um, that if you get, in particular in the Pacific Northwest, you get the mature canopy forest. They don't, there's not a lot of undergrowth to feed critters, whereas if you break it up, have uh, green belts, gardens, fruit trees, uh, et cetera, the population can actually be a higher concentration than you might see in a forest. And also in forests, you're more likely to see a range of predators. Um, and, and, but one thing to, to note is that even in this situation in the urban area where wildlife are recolonizing, when uh, they're not being fed by humans, when deer or other animals run out of food, they move to another area, which disperses the population. And if, conversely, um, they are fed and start concentrating, there's a number of consequences from that. Uh, the first is that deer in close proximity to one another are more susceptible to disease, um, particularly if they're sp spending many hours near a, f a feeding station in, s in small herd-like groups. It, they're not necessarily a herding animal like elk, but you will get congregations of deer and they can pass disease to each other. Um, and as they spend time in backyards uh, and get fed, uh, they become habituated to humans and less fearful, and they become aggressive at times during the, the uh, mating season or if they feel they're not getting enough food or other uh, a dog is inserted into the situation uh, or, or similar. Um, and also, a high concentration of deer lead to negative consequences such as more yard and property damage, threats to domestic pets, and possible injury to humans. Um, and feeding deer, particularly if they're given high, highly uh, caloric rich food that just are, are not their natural diet, you can actually get health problems or even uh, major digestive orders that lead to death. Um, and we also consulted various experts around town and, and the state level to understand um, this issue as well. And as I mentioned, I looked at a number of cities and how they've managed it. So with this information, uh, City Council decided to pass an ordinance in November 2017. The, the ordinance prohibits feeding deer and raccoons. We added raccoons because they spread disease, including roundworms and rabies. They can attack domestic pets or even threaten humans, particularly small ones. Um, and in terms of how we are implementing it. 2018, the focus is on education to raise awareness. Um, and in, in general, we're doing, we're doing that in, in whichever way is most effective. This is one of the things we're, we're doing. I, I presented it at a neighborhood group uh, a couple of months ago. Um, we've got, as I mentioned, a, web, a website, and we've got every, all our uh, partners in, in, uh, in the agencies who work with us are helping to pass this information around when they get requests from people. So that's the general focus on 2018. Um, when uh, people are noted as frequent feeders um, and they're not sort of picking up on the general education, they, they might be contacted by either Fish and Wildlife or a code enforcement officer or maybe the Humane Society will inform them that th this is not a, a good thing to do. Um, the ordinance does uh, allow a fine of up to $250. Uh, the, the way the city does compliance to ordinances is th something like that is always the last resort. and so. It's unlikely we're going to, you know, be out there finding people left and right. That's something we hope not to do. Um, certainly not this year. So that's um, a general uh, overview of um, how we pass the ordinance. Um, there are some exceptions uh, in the ordinance. Uh, use of bird feeders is okay. Um, food derived from landscape and garden plants. Obviously, you can't eliminate all 
uh, plants. You might not want to. You might even want to have deer-friendly plants in your yard. You might want to plant a garden. No problem. Uh, food used to feed domestic pets or farm animals is uh, obviously exempt. However, with these, uh, we were hoping that people will have the attitude of it's kind of a judicious uh, understanding of the consequences of being kind of sloppy with these things. For example, with bird feeders, if they're kept off the ground where deer can't reach them or raccoons can't climb to them, um, if they're hopefully not resulting in massive amounts of spill. Um, and if you've got fruit trees, please pick up the fruit when you can. Same with gardens. And obviously, people want to eat their vegetables instead of feed them to deer, usually anyway. But these are just common sense things that even though there's no enforcement against these sorts of things. We hope people will have kind of a common sense perspective on these. Um, and also feeding domestic pets indoors is preferable to, to putting food uh, outdoors. I assume that one of the largest, I can't say this is research-based, but I assume one of the largest food sources for urban raccoons is probably uh, cat food and dog food put in people's backyards. Um, so I, that's, a, that's a factoid. I, I don't know if it's true or not. but. Uh, it's possibly true. Um, some additional context, it's already illegal under state law to feed large carnivores such as bears and coyotes, et cetera. Um, and I, I want to note that if we don't feed deer or raccoons, they'll still be with us. But they'll hopefully be less concentrated, less likely to be habituated, less likely to cause problems. Um, but uh, in an ordinance of, of this sort, plus education, is not going to eliminate wildlife by any means. We'll, we'll still be. Um, able to enjoy animals in the urban environment, and we still need to be aware of urban wildlife issues, such as being aware of the presence of deer on roads, and in particular in Bellingham. And I'm sure Cole will uh, go into additional things that people might want to be thinking about in management strategies that would help uh, people um, manage or enjoy deer without causing issues or problems. Just uh, a quick uh, semi-humorous uh, sign I just encountered today. I um, thought this was uh, very clever. And lastly, by the way, that, that small print says, good luck finding a deer dentist. It decays your teeth. Uh, lastly, we've got resources available. This first uh, line here is our new website. And there's information there. We'll be adding more information over time. Uh, I've got uh, some information there about either wildlife emergency or nuisance issues, which uh, Was Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife is a good contact there. Code enforcement, if it gets to the point of people are not picking up on general education and there's serious problems that need to be responded to, um, that's the, the um, number to call there. The Humane Society has a wide range of wildlife-oriented and animal-oriented services, uh, but particularly with regard to injured wildlife in Bellingham, um, that's the number that people can call. And dead animal removal is another issue that, that sometimes occurs. And um, the Humane Society is also uh, available to assist with that. So that is my presentation. We'll, take, we'll definitely take questions from from everybody, um, you probably don't want to ask me a lot of detailed biology questions. I think a lot of those will be answered in a minute, but I'd be more than willing to take questions about the ordinance in a few minutes. But in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and queue up the next presentation for Cole. And you're welcome to come up now. Oh, no, I, I think we'll, if it's okay, unless somebody has a burning question right now about the ordinance, I'm more than willing to answer that. All right, well, thanks, Mark. Thanks, Brad, for queuing me up. Um, well, my name's Cole Caldwell, and as you can see, I kind of wanted to break the ice. I'm going to be um, presenting more on deer today than raccoons. That's kind of where I emphasized my, um, my presentation on, but I wanted to at least provide you with that. And I kind of coined the presentation Ur Urban Wildlife Stewardship. So that's pretty broad. And we will touch on a few other critters, but mainly um, deer today. 
Uh, my background is that I'm a public servant for the state of Washington, so I work for the people um, to serve Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife's mission. Uh, as you can read, it's, it's up there. It's basically to preserve, protect, and perpetuate fish and wildlife ecosystems and provide uh, sustainable fish and wildlife rec and commercial opportunities. So it's a long one. And uh, my swath of jurisdiction goes from King County all the way up to the border, so Whatcom as well as the islands, so Region 4. Um, we have myself, a full-time wildlife conflict specialist for District 12, which is Whatcom and Skagit. And then we have another guy who's split um, down in King County, basically. So we're, there's basically only two of us, if you cut us into you know, our, our jobs and such, to cover the whole region in six counties. So um, take that in mind when you give us a call and you have um, an issue. And on top of that, there's enforcement as well. But that's just um, kind of where we're at and what the, the broad sense of the area that we cover. Um, so to start off, I kind of wanted to go over some critical and historical perspectives regarding wildlife damage. Um, Brad touched on this uh, a little bit. So over time, human and wildlife um, population growth has increased. Therefore, we've had increased interactions and, and decreased tolerance, basically. Um, with that, there's, you know, different people have different tolerance levels. If you're a more rural person, you may have more acceptance of said animal as opposed to other animal or so, so on and so forth. In an urban environment, um, you may have lived here for 30 years, whereas if you just moved in the, the neighborhood and now you see all these deer, you may have a new problem that you're not aware of or know how to deal with. So um, that's kind of what we deal with a lot. Um, as well as well-intended actions sometimes have unintended consequences. So what you do on your land maybe affects your neighbor and vice versa. Um, and in addition to that, you know, there's value differences. Your one neighbor may love the deer and the next door neighbor wants to, hates the deer and then you have that dynamic to work with and we have that dynamic to work with too as an agency and the city hears about it and so on and so forth. So we, um, we build off that and try to provide a nice balance and common ground when we come into these situations. Uh, and here's the situation. So we have the critter, right? In this case, that's a very old raccoon by the way. Uh, he or she's well past their prime. Um, and then we have people. As you can tell, we're distracted these days a little. Um, and as Brad mentioned, habitat loss and fragmentation is a major issue, not only here, but everywhere across the United States and the world for that matter. As you look at that picture, you can see that the green, and that represents um, foliage and trees and cover and food and everything else that a wildlife, that wildlife would use. And there's not as much of that <laughs> in that picture as you might expect. So that, um, you know, that causes issues. And, you know, as you can see, that's lack of sanctuaries, areas where wildlife could exist and should. So good planning and good um, cities such as Bellingham actually have um, cool areas where wildlife can exist. In the back of this building, I just went and explored, and there's a, a nature trail back there that's certified by um, the organization which you mentioned. Yes. So um, things like that are, are exquisite, and some cities don't have that and others do, and this one actually does. So um, that's unique. Um, so we'll go right into what I do and what my organization does. And this is kind of to build a platform into what, when we go into biology and some of the management techniques. So what we deal with and what we do is basically we deal a lot with deer herbivory and rubbing issues. So the, the bucks will rub their velvet off and antlers and they'll scrape your brand new trees that you plant or just your older trees, whatever they feel like. Um, and then Everyone like, has seen that picture on the left there. <laughs> You're probably familiar with that. That's the browse line. Um, and deer love to, to browse. They are browsers. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But um, people get upset about that. It's not what they paid for and not what they expected, for sure. Um, when we approach these situations, um, in those last two, it's definitely deer. But in a garden setting, we have to think about, OK, um, there's indicators that it is a deer, and there's sometimes it's not a deer. There's rabbits, cottontails, we have insect herbivory, we have raccoons that are notoriously intelligent as well, um, and it could be elk, elk, bears, you name it, oh my. Um, vehicle collisions, which Brad mentioned, or I think Mark mentioned, um, is something that we, you know, we, we like to educate people about because um, deer are crepuscular in nature, so that means that they're more active in the early, e early evening, late late evening, right? Late evening, early morning. There we go. And so you need to be aware, or we all need to be aware that that, that kind of um, behavior thus causes us to be more di due diligent, situational awareness, beware of road topography, and that kind of gets into this one. So here in Washington, we have a lot of vegetation that abuts the road. 
And as we come around a corner, Highway 20 is a good example. You're going around a nice turn, and boom, wildlife can be right there. And it can it doesn't know you're there either because it can't hear you necessarily coming around a corner. So just being aware of that is something we we preach a lot. Um, aggression aggression is 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 something that we. Um, it's, it's, it's more of a response from a wildlife perspective and from a management perspective. So fight or, fight or flight, right? We've all heard of that. So in many cases, um, an animal will choose one or the other based on space and um, competition things. So if you get in front of an animal and it's food, it's young, um, potentially it, during the mating season, uh, <laughs> there's lots of different things there. Um, you know, even, a, even your dog could be perceived as a predator, so then it either has a choice to run or fight and that can cause dangerous situations. So we, we do a lot of um, education along these lines. And then we also talk about habituation issues. Um, it can cause uh, a lot of different problems. Fawns, which Brad mentioned, are a big deal um, because instinctively fawns lay down when they wanna hide. And that's what they're, they know the, the doe will hurry up and lick them clean, eat any feces or any kind of um, placenta so they're, they're free of smell. But at the same time, we see them and they're like, oh, they're abandoned. But that not, that's not necessarily the case. That's their natural mechanisms to, to lay down, seek cover. The doe often goes out and forages and comes back during the first um, while after they're born, they're, they're, they're suckling. So they're gonna be staying put. They will follow the doe as we've all seen. But for the most part, um, when you see one just laying in the bushes or and it appears abandoned, we, we urge you strongly to leave it there because the doe will definitely come back or most likely will come back unless she's been killed. Um, we mentioned the rut and some of the, the reproductive side of things. So during the rut, the males, this is a mule deer too, so don't mind my, my non-species significance there, but the males get pretty aggressive and they get very focused. And so they've been known to slam into things <laughs> and attack things such as cars, screens, you name it. Uh, mirrors, reflections, just anything actually that may be competition. Sometimes they just like to be wild, so we need to be aware of that. I was I was told um, that a, a man was actually gored last year during a run, I believe, um, somewhere down south. So it can happen anywhere. Um, you, you know, just maybe for surprising an animal such as this that has um, antlers for defense could could cause a reaction that you don't want. But pets is a big one. So um, my own yard is a nice little sanctuary for for deer. I live in Anacortes. And last year, my dog was attacked once, and I was attacked once in the backyard. And it was my own fault, because I, I just opened the door and let the dog out, right? But that doesn't happen anymore, because the dog was attacked, and I was attacked. So I learned from those two experiences, um, just to kind of open the door, look around. They love to just browse through my backyard and so forth. But they're, they, they can be very aggressive, especially when there's a fawn nearby. Um, for competition as far as space and so forth and food, uh, more so the, the image on the left. So in my neighborhood, the deer are pretty competitive. I've seen them fight and be injured um, multiple times. And you know that's, that's just animals being animals. They compete for space and food and for things like that. So you need to be aware that during certain times of the year or even in your own backyard, if it's a hot spot for all the goodies, you might have actually more and more deer coming there, especially if you feed or you previously fed. And that can cause um, negative interactions among species or between species. So. These animals are highly adaptive, as you all know. Um, we have raccoons, which are um, well suited for urban environments. They're intelligent. They have the ability to manipulate things with their with their paws. Um, they can squeeze into tight places, and uh, yeah, that's just the beginning of it. But also, deer are highly adaptive, and coyotes too. Those are the, those are the main three that I can think of. But deer do very well in urban settings. They're meander as long as they pay attention to which way the road is and if the traffic if they can learn how to read traffic signals they're going to be okay um, but this also causes other issues such as predator attraction so my old professor used to say raccoons are the gummy bears of the, of the cougars and then everywhere you have a, a raccoon you'll probably have cougars and deer as well so um, black bears love to predate on young fawns especially when they drop right they have all that smell the olfactory of a sense, sense organ of a bear is severely heightened and they can smell them from a long ways away. And cougars, they'll predate on large animals as well as small. So you're in, an, in a forested environment or near one, you should be aware that there are predators in the area and that you could potentially attract them um, by congregating deer in one space. So anyway, uh, sources of mortality, like I just sort of mentioned, was coyotes, cougars, black bears, domestic dogs, um, collisions with vehicles, et cetera. 
um, regulated hunting um, competition through, you know, they could um, be, they could fight and die or they could starve and die. Um, there's also winter, so if they have a harsh winter and they're not available to get the food they need, they starve there as well. Um, emigration, in some cases, when they're just dispersing out, they may not make it. Um, it's a fact of life. And then disease, so many of you have seen hair loss here. That's actually um, not, that's more of, it was a result of a louse, a lice that was in, uh, introduced here a long time ago. So they do fine as long as it's not severe and then we have a bad winter or cold spell. Um, but that does reduce, it can reduce their, uh, um, other diseases can reduce their ability to actually move or digest food and all those other types of things. Um, so we'll go into diseases a little bit more as we move on when we get into the feeding aspects. But um, as I believe Brad mentioned, we do have ticks locally, um, dog ticks specifically. I've had those on me and my dog, and I've seen them on deer and, um, and squirrels, actually, Douglas squirrels around. So be aware of that. Um, ticks. Um, I mean, fleas, definitely, definitely have some fleas around. Um, lice, yes. Human transition, definitely. Um, so we have roundworms and we have hookworms potentially in this area, and those are zoonotic, so you can get those. So be careful when you are picking up feces and doing things. Make sure you wear gloves and wash your hands and so forth. Um, Lyme disease has been documented in Washington State. It's not here necessarily. I don't know. I don't work for the for those folks, but um, it is something you should be aware of, so always be aware that you know ticks could potentially carry that disease. Um, it's much more prevalent on the East Coast, so um, if you have any questions about that, maybe talk to your county health officials. Uh, acidosis, which we're going to talk about today, is specific to deer feeding, as well as um, enterox entertoxemia, enter enterotoxemia, sorry, and that's overeating disease. And then parasites, um, which I mentioned really briefly, are some of the roundworms that can be found in we won't go into rabies, but some of the raccoon feces. So getting into deer biology and why it's important and some of the negative impacts to feeding, um, we're just gonna talk about some of the basics of deer biology. So in essence, deers are, deer are browsers. Um, they're ruminants, they're, they're herbivores, and we're gonna talk about what a ruminant is and why it's important to what we're talking about here. So they like woody shrubs, herbaceous plants. Um, some plants um, are, are more nutritious or more palatable or more sought after, whereas others are more deterrent and they don't like the taste, but they will eat them. So don't think that they won't eat something just because it's on our list of plants that aren't edible. <laughs> they might try it, right? Um, and then they are <clears throat> fairly long-lived. So a deer in the wild usually lives from five, about five years, but they can live up to 10. So that's, that's a good range. So you know that you, if you have a, a doe who, who's having a fawn or twins each year, um, more than likely you're gonna see her again the next year and there's maybe even the offspring. And then, uh, like I said earlier, they're adapted well to human environments. So what makes a deer's digestive system special? And why does it, and how does that play into what we're gonna talk about today? Well, like I mentioned, they're herbivores. Um, like other animals, they can't break down cellulose, so they rely on symbiotic organisms, such as prokaryotes, bacteria, fungi, in, this, in their stomach um, to help them break down those um, cellular, well, actually, the cellulose, we'll just say. And in order to do that, um, they basically use the process of fermentation. So if you like beer, you can kind of think of it as like that, the fermentation process. It's not the exact same, but they use those organisms to break a substance down and produce other things, such as methane. Um, so these animals tend to burp a lot. Same with cows. So if you're familiar with cow biology, same thing. Um, so they have four chambered stomachs, and they're a four gut fermenter, same as cows. And here we go. So here's the little diagram of their, basically their intestinal system. The rumen is basically the holding space for food. So they, they, they eat food constantly, they're always, they're manipulating with their tongue, they're chewing a little bit mecha mechanically with their teeth, and then they get a little saliva in there that breaks down a little bit, and they put it in their stomach, or in their first stomach, the rumen. And that's a holding space, they, look how big the rumen is, they can put a lot of food in there. Um, with that, they, they do something called chewing the cud, so they'll, they'll regurgitate their food, and put it back up in, they'll chew it again, it goes into the reticulum. Reticulum is a mixing unit for bacteria. So is the rest of this, they're all back, there's bacteria in all this, but the reticulum is really where a lot of the bacteria in those organisms live, and they help break down the, the, the contents and the cellulose even more so that nutritious um, elements can be ex, um, absorbed into the body. But it's still not done, so it has to regurgitate multiple times and keep doing this process, and eventually it makes it into the omasum, um, um, where 
water is absorbed, finer, finer particular, uh, partic particles are actually absorbed, and it gets passed eventually into the abomasum, and that is where the majority of nutrient upload occurs. So they get the finest particles, you're gonna get the best stuff, and it, all the nutrients in the cycling has done its job, gets into the intestines, and then it's excreted as little pellets. So that's everything that couldn't make it, basically. And why that's important is because, we're not gonna go into that, that's how it really gets into the details um, about how the, the stomach works. So I was, if you had any questions, we'll refer to that. Um, we'll come back to that. But the general risk, which we kind of alleviated to earlier, um, you know, associated with feeding, um, include many things. As you can see up there, it's, sorry, there's a lot up there. But the, the last one <clears throat> is particularly important because of the, the biology I just explained to you is their stomach. But as you can see here, there's also a, a, a list of other risks um, that feeding causes and can lead to. So for example, um, luring deer away from natural foods, causing um, deer to alter their behavior. Um, if you lose, if a, an animal loses its wild instincts and its um, fear of humans in some ways, we can cause a risk to us, right? So it may love you, but when the, when the neighbor kids get off the bus and they come and encounter that deer, they don't know how to act and they may startle it and then that could cause a safety uh, situation. So there's a, there's a long list there. We won't go through them all, but the last one such as um, disease, I kind of wanted to go into a little bit because it's particular um, to feeding. And especially when we overfeed a deer, when we don't know, we don't understand its biology. So um, such things as apples and large amounts of grain, um, beets and other high carbohydrate foods, which Mark mentioned, um, when exposed, when a deer is exposed to that suddenly, it can cause something called um, ruminant acidosis and um, it's, it's, it's lethal. It occurs very quickly and it's, it can be found here as well as everywhere, anywhere where there's deer and people are feeding them. So everyone should be aware of that. There's also another um, disease which is called um, induced laminitis, um, and that's where basically the, the animal becomes lame, and it, then for, thus forth, if it's lame, it can be predated on, it's, it's, it can't eat as well, et cetera, and it can eventually cause some severe problems there as well. Um, as, there's also enterotoxemia, which is overeating disease or pulpy kidney disease. And this one is very similar to the other disease. That's basically they, the two and two go together. But this is basically when you feed them specifically grain um, in high abundance. And a, a deer um, therefore gets an overload of bacteria in their stomach and their pH drops in their belly. And they get, when those um, overload of bacteria form, they also produce byproducts, which are toxins. So they basically poison themselves. They're, they're poisoned. They're poisoned. And the other, the other um, this last one does that too. So um, ruminal acidosis, they just cause different things. Some cause lactic acid buildup, some cause other toxins. They're both a buildup of, of nasties. And that causes the animal to die very quickly within 24 to 72 hours. Um, you know, and there is no effective treatment for this. They've, in domestic animals, we've, there's some vaccinations that are, that are available for ruminants. But um, in some cases, you know, it's, it depends on the severity and if it's actually gonna be effective or not. So we don't really, I don't think that you should, <laughs> we're not gonna be out doing that to deer, that's for sure. So, um, you know, that's why it's basically imperative that people think about, you know, prohibiting supplemental feeding as a, or even supporting it. We as an agency do it in severe cases where animals are starving and so forth. And we use hay, you know what I mean? We're, and we know what we're doing and so forth. So you might've heard about on the east side, sometimes we'll supplementally feed elk herds or something like that. Um, and we do that with great care. And we, we put a lot of math into that even like, okay, we have this many head of elk. This is how much feed they should use. No, no, no. Um, but, you know, basically, Survival will be increased if we remove causal foods, and that's why we basically support not doing that. Um, tips for living with wildlife. So here's what I like to say is that there's always a bigger problem. The, my organization and my staff and I deal a lot with elk, and there are elk where there are deer. So and then, you know, just be aware that it's deer today, it could be elk tomorrow. And even in the urban setting, I've worked in a lot of areas where elk make it into their backyards. And that's a, that's a different problem altogether. Um, so what are the options? So right, I like to categorize it as passive and active management. So passive at management is basically, you know, what I've just listed. So exclusionary fences, doing behavioral modification, repellents, 
um, ways to do road management so that you have higher visibility, you have flashing signs, um, plant changes. So in your yard and during winter, especially when they're food scarce, you plant things that they can eat on the periphery that are easy to access, that the deer can browse, but they don't make it into the, the goods, the goods, right? So you allow them some stuff on the outside that costs money, of course, but you never know, you can get free, free, free stuff sometimes. So maybe reach out and we'll see what happens. I can get you something. But, um, you know, also natural occurrence. So just letting nature take its course. A lot of people believe in that and we we'll, we'll, we allow that to be an option for sure. And then active management, Brad mentioned fertility control. It's, it's not even an option. It's too expensive. Um, research is finding that basically um, uh, you do, it causes more problems than you could even imagine. Some, it, the effectiveness is, is questionable in some ways. Um, you also get an overabundance of, of males or females, depending on what they're doing. So that's just something that we don't really want to support here necessarily, as well as relocation. Uh, how how could we afford that? And it's just that's a tough one as well. Um, but they are options, so they have to be up there. Hunting and special permits, lethal removal, of course, culling an animal, but that's an individual. And we deal with animals on a population. You know, there's ten in your backyard. Taking one out is going to be a band aid, but it's not going to cause anything. So or solve anything. So basically, we have to get to the point where we either have communal actions to to, to develop some kind of tolerance level. And we'll get into that in a second. But habitat and conservation of um, conservation and management of habitat too. So knowing that your forest, working with your community forest people, making sure that there's ample food, or maybe you could help them plant food, or I don't know what the what that entails. But other people have done that in other places. Um, and then predator management's one, but that's another one that's kind of um, not well supported. So, or at least it's it, it would be. It's a, it's a tool, but it needs to be used in the right manner, and it's really ineffective in an urban environment, let's just say. Um, so here's something out from the islands that I wanted to bring up and show you all. This is a woman who I went and met with, and she has um, like a whole garden and all this vineyards and a bunch of other stuff that she's growing, and she has severe deer issues. So she got inventive and created this. Um, she basically electrified, <laughs> um, she thought about how a deer eats and how a deer bends over to, and uses its long neck and you know has its ears and so forth. So she was thinking, okay, well, if I was a deer, how would I approach this? And she looked at how the browse was on her plants. So she created this and it's been severely effective. So basically any deer that comes in the, the garden is now getting its ears zapped or its mouth or whatever when they, when they go in to, to get a little nip of the goodies. And she's been doing this for, I don't know, it's been five years now and she's had great success. So innovation is, is, a, is a cool thing to try. Maybe it'll fit your, your unique background or your yard, I don't know. But she, it worked well with her. We tend to do a lot of fencing. Um, and don't pay too much attention to the schematic on the right. It uses barbed wire. We wouldn't necessarily go with that. We'd probably use um, electrified wire or something to that extent. But the the design as a whole is pretty is pretty standard. So you use a hog wire or a woven wire, um, you know, up to you'd want to you'd want to make your fence eight feet. So that's deer can hop, as we all know, they can jump pretty high. And you would want to do a you can also tier that with something that's even funkier. Um, people in Anacortes that I've spoken with are now using it the, the, the small diameter stuff, and they lay it down at a small angle towards their garden. And a deer won't step on it. They don't want to they, they feel insecure, right? It feels like their legs are going to get stuck. And then a good benefit of this is that the grass can grow through it, the plants can grow through it, and they can easily lift it and remove it. So that's why I threw that little piece on the right. That's kind of the concept, is that they can lift it, put it back down, they have it on an angle, it protects their garden up to five feet <laughs> on a swath, and it's pretty cheap. Um, so this is some more innovation stuff that people are doing. And it's pretty effective from what I hear. Um, other potential feeding solutions, or solutions, I should say, are um, the local feeding ordinance, which is City of Bellingham has introduced, and others too. Um, planning that diversity of species and around the periphery, and making sure that um, you have stuff that produces a lot of mass. Deers love acorns. Well, that's not going to be us up here. We don't have much of that. But nut, nut or fruiting trees is good. Um, plants, let's see, protect plants during the summer by making uh, winter food available. That's more or less fencing and doing things like that. You can use 
chemical deterrents or organic deterrents. I have a little list for you. If you want to make your own remedies, get some ghost peppers out, burn some taste buds off a deer, you can try that. Um, there's also managing habitat quality and taking into consideration the season. So if you have a big evergreen or multiple evergreens, the deer may seek out your yard for, for shelter. And just being aware that that's probably what they're going to use it for and that may drive them to see what else, your garden. Oh, look at that, there's also food right there. So just kind of putting those two together will help you strategize about how you should manage um, your area. And then of course, um, clearing out all those blackberries, you may have just introduced a new problem, right? Because now that may have been the one deterrent keeping the deer from coming in from this giant swath of land. And before they were only coming in from over here, but now they got all that area to come in. So you got to think about how they're approaching, where they're approaching from, the behavior, and that way you can manage it best. Um, education and improving an understanding of social tolerance and social tolerance in general is the main thing that I strive to do. Um, given the factors that are in an urban setting, it's really difficult to understand that we're never going to get rid of all the deer. They're always going to be here. We can take care of this, 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 or this, but we're always going to have this, 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 and this. So it's a tough, it's a tough pill to swallow. Um, but it's something we can always help you with, and that's why we're here. We have the expertise and the knowledge to help you and get you to that point where, you know, we have positivity and optimism there too. So if, we, if you think we can do it, we can do it. If, you're, if, if some folks are more in the negative and saying, well, I'm just, you know, never going to be able to help me, well, that's not the right attitude because I'll be able to help you with 90%, let's just say, but there's always going to be something I can't do or be beyond myself or my control. So, you know, when we get into planting, there's, we have lists that are derived through WDFW and research, et cetera. These are annuals and garden herbs that are supposedly, right, deer resistant. That doesn't mean they're deer, no, you know what I mean? They'll, they'll still try these. So I was trying to think of the word, deer resistant or deer proof, there we go, deer proof. Um, this is, you know, California Eschazolcia uh, californica, California poppy. I've seen them munch that down in my backyard. But it's up there, they probably don't like it, and they probably had some, some bad digestive <laughs> problems after that. But for the, for the most part, this is a short list, and you know, I can provide you on the Living with Wildlife pamphlet or some information later on with a whole swath of things that can help you. Um, other considerations are that, you know, we talked about this earlier about kind of what our actions do and the implications of that to others. That's, that's part of that education too, because a lot of people think, well, this is my land and I don't give a damn about the neighbor. That's not the case. We have to think about how, what our actions do and how they reciprocate through the community and not only to our neighbors, but to other animals. So you could have a bear problem next year or you could have something else if you're, not, if you're not taking care of those bird feeders right away, like picking them up off the ground. You're gonna bring in squirrels, you're gonna bring in deer, and you might bring in black bear. You don't want a black bear for sure. And then, you know, in the future, you may lead to more restrictions or you don't, you, something else might happen. We never know what's gonna happen, but if, we, if we're proactive in thinking solution-wise about how we can better our, ourselves and our neighborhoods and so forth, we can hopefully get to a better place. So those are just some other considerations. But as we all know, how are these decisions made? It can be a head scratcher, right? So <laughs> it's kind of tough. Um, we have different regulatory um, levels, right? We have federal laws, Endangered Species Act, you can't go out and club an endangered species, that's for sure. Um, state laws, you have hunting season permits, etc. We have local laws such as firearm um, restrictions within counties and city limits, etc. Um, and we also have public safety concerns that are that govern those things. We have communal agreements such as an HOA or a city or someone can come together and say, hey, we, we, we're going to live with these animals, but we're not going to, we can only tolerate so much. When the damage gets to X amount of dollars, when the safety concerns are X and Y and Z, that could, that could there could stimulate a tolerance standard where action is then implemented, right? So that's why we really kind of move towards individual stewardship and community level organization because you can come together as a, as a body and say, this is what we can accept and this is what we can't. And that's kind of what happened here with the ordinance. People were like, hey, it's becoming too much. I can't afford this, at least from my, my understanding of how the, the ordinance came to be in a lot of situations, people with safety and money concerns. Um, so consequences and our role is kind of why we're here. I mean, education, community level management, and habitat stewardship, and our own property stewardship is something that really matters. And it'll help us as we not only deal with the woodpecker 
or the deer or the squirrel, you know, everything, it's, it's you're going to have this, it's just a good practice to have in general and having that understanding of what your role is and what your neighbor's role is. So as I mentioned earlier, imprinted wildlife have a lot of problems. Um, I've worked for other organizations where if an animal was found to be imprinted or um, lost its habituated or no longer wild, they just kill it. So it doesn't get a second chance. There is no rehabilitation. So, you know, there's, there's that to consider as well. Um, ecological impacts, so deer browsing can have negative impacts. It's, there's some papers out there that show that songbirds, ground nesting songbirds specifically, have declines when there's increased deer populations or overabundance or dense, high density of deers when you're concentrating them in one area. So that can impact um, not only bird communities, but soil composition, weird stuff. It just kind of just goes down and reciprocates out. So you have to be aware of the, um, the ecology there, right? So it could impact seed banks and st vegetation structure. Have any of you ever went through the forest, community forest, and seen that all the ferns are just nipped? So sword ferns are supposed to have a point. But when you don't have a, when they're all nipped, that means you have deer around. So that's just an indicator that you may have a couple deer in your neighborhood for sure. And then traditional management methods within an urban environment just don't work. We can't go out and hunt necessarily, right? You have safety concerns, you're in tight quarters, you're in suburbia, you can't be discharging high-powered rifles. So we basically depend upon outreach and education. And that's what we use to basically implement sound stewardship and adaptivity and the management strategy, uh, strategies that we try to put forth. So, and that's why I'm here today, just kind of talk about that. But you may be interested in the deer population um, within the city, and we don't, we don't have an assessment of that, and that isn't something that we probably will be assessing in the near future. But there are other research projects going on locally um, that will help us get to some of these questions about the deer population as, as a whole and in general. So basically we have two. We have one that's WDFW um, sponsored and ongoing and we have one that's by the Swinomish tribe. Um, the Swinomish tribe is actually occurring a little bit south of us or to the, to, the, uh, to the east of us and to the south. But we also have a project going on that's um, assessing basically population estimates and other things of, of survival and such similar to the Swinomish study. And those are ongoing. We're just at the infancy of those projects, so there's nothing to really report there. So if you were curious about what our deer population is, the answer is we don't currently know. We, we, we do implement strat or methodologies now to extrapolate a deer population, but that's more for harvest style, so our harvest management type techniques. So we get off of however many animals are harvested, we can extrapolate off a formula how many animals exist within a given GMU or an area game management unit. So it's not as specific or as precise as what these studies are gonna be given us. So that's a really broad and coarse overview of how we estimate populations as ecologists and biologists. But um, just know that we're in the works of doing some of that. And um, we definitely feel for you that in the urban environment that there's a lot of deer and that's probably highly um, focused on your backyards and your gardens. So. Um, additional resources, which I mentioned earlier, include um, a whole swath of things that I can provide you. So I'm going to give you my contact information here in just a second. And basically, there's gardening, landscaping, deer deterrence, repellents, fence schematics, the whole, the whole gamut. I can give you a ton of stuff. And it'll hopefully help you um, get somewhere that's in a better place if you are having problems with deer currently. Um, there's my information. I'm gonna go fast, just kidding, no. Um, you guys can see it, I was just being, I was just kidding there. But yeah, yeah, that's my email, it's probably the best to give me a call on that one. Um, I'll get back to you soon and I can send you all the materials if you have questions and so, so forth. Other than that, we're basically ready for questions. Thank you for what you're doing and I, um, I have some concerns that I wanna talk about because three years ago, I went to, um, met with the mayor, with Mitch Friedwin of Conservation Northwest, with Paul DeBryan of the Fish and Wildlife Department, and with Eric Johnston from Public Works and myself. And my concern was that we have these er natural urban wildlife corridors. Um, one is around Lakeway and Electric Street, another one is on Barclay. And we talk about the fact that we're drying in the deer, but the other issue is that their water sources are drying up 
on the outskirts. So Barclay, or um, Galbraith Mountain, where I mountain bike, there is no water up there in the summer. So they're having to cross urban um, arterials to get to Whatcom Falls, to get to the Silver um, Beach woods, and they can't navigate across the, the roads and they're getting hit. And um, I went to the city and said, I think we have a problem. Right now, over 500 acres have been clear cut up on Galbraith. So a lot of their refuge, their um, ability to forage in the woods, the natural woods, are, are now gone for them. Not to mention that we're spraying their, um, Janicki is now spraying Roundup in all of those clear cuts, which is taking away any of the natural food sources they might have. And then they're spraying crossbow in all of the roadsides so that they're taking away any of the foraging on the the sides of the natural roads or the forest roads up on um, Galbraith Mountain. So my, my, the, the decision that was made out of that meeting was that the um, mayor asked for um, animal control to do a study to start taking data on the wildlife injuries and the wildlife kills on the roadway so we could see where the problem was and to know where it's happening, what kind of animal, and what time of year. And then she asked for PSAs to go on the radio, and then she asked for action to happen. Well, after a year, there were no PSAs, despite all of my calls to the city, Public Works. No PSAs, no action on anything. Finally, I went to Ted Carlson, the head of Public Works, who finally got a PSA, which I had done all the research, um, Minnesota, Michigan, Ohio, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, they have more urban deer than we do. So if you go and look at what they've done, there's lots of research. And so I provided them with multiple PSAs that are being done in other places. And so that happened probably two years ago through multiple calls to the city, multiple emails, probably three now that I still haven't gotten a response from Public Works about. There is still, there's no contract revisions with um, animal control to look at where the, the um, wildlife kills are happening on the roadways. Nothing's happening. And um, I just sent an email last week again, and I'm still getting no response. So I'm, I'm really frustrated at this point because we're talking about not feeding the wildlife, but we're not talking about why they're coming in for other reasons. And for me, as I consider myself a, an environmentalist, I think we're setting up this wildlife. If we're taking away their refuge up in the woods, up on Galbraith and other places through logging, where, where through climate change their water sources are drying up in these really hot summers, they have no access to get to Whatcom Falls but to cross these roads. We're not educating any of the um, drivers on their habits except for the, the, these PSAs. Public Works refuses to do any signage, which other communities have done. And I would like some action. I have a letter from um, the Mount Baker Group from Sierra Club. They're interested in following through. We're not going away. This is going to be, continue to be an issue. And I think there's other people here who probably share some of those same issues and interests in um, making sure that we're not just taking care of the wildlife, but we're taking care of motorists too. My husband's... Uh, Deer in November ran into our truck. That was $500 for a deductible. The deer ran off. It was during mating season. It was early in the morning. And um, that's $500 for us. That results in injuries. I've seen really serious collisions in which deer have had broken legs that are just hanging. Um, and, and because cars are going too fast and they're not paying attention, I think that the city needs to step up. And I'd like the support of Department of Fish and Wildlife to help them do that. I'll uh, respond to some of that, and we can uh, see if anybody else has a response. Uh, some of those things I, I wasn't aware of. I kind of came into this issue less than a year ago. Um, uh, I came into this issue less than a year ago. I wasn't aware uh, of all the history, but I've taken notes, and I'll pass this along to make sure the message gets reinforced. I did see some emails about signage. There are, there are there departments that have control of that. Um, so, but I'll certainly pass that along, and I, I think you point out uh, an important uh, lesson, which is that this is more complicated than it than it appears, even from the complexity that we've already learned. That there's uh, a lot of things happening in the habitat that make a difference. I, I want to say there are some positive things as well. The the county um, a couple of years ago took 
control of about, I think it's about 9,000 acres around Lake Whatcom. That's going to be slowly reforested back into a kind of a natural old growth forest. The city regularly is, is, is accumulating habitat around Lake Whatcom in particular this is to, to sustain the, the habitat around the lake in order to protect the water supply and help reduce nutrients that aren't supposed to be getting to the lake. So, so there's some improvement of habitat, but there's also these private lands that we don't have any direct control of, but to the extent we have money, we're actually purchasing those if we have a, a willing seller. So, so it, there's some uh, trends in both direction, I think, but, but you're right that it, certainly if there's logging, that's, that's a major issue for driving animals. But uh, all I can say is that I've taken notes on all these and I'll, uh, I'll make some inquiries and we can talk after the meeting and, and see if we can connect some of those dots. But um, there's, yeah, there's many, many issues and, and um, certainly just awareness on the part of motorists. I mean, I, I tend to find in areas where I think deer might be jutting out, I'm really super aware and that's another part of an educational uh, campaign that's needed to, to just note to, to motorists that you cannot control the speed at which animals come bounding out at you, and so, so that's um, an issue. Um, so, anyway, uh, thanks for your uh, perspective, and I'll make sure that get, gets communicated to the the requisite city folks. And if anybody else has any thoughts, yeah, about just uh, you, you raised a good point, and this is true in a lot of issues in fish and wildlife and the environment that we're not inventing these or these we're not unique in what whatever. Um, there's the American Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies and, and the Urban Wildlife Management Institute. A lot of states, and I, as many of you have lived in other states, and I lived in a suburb of D.C., uh, whitetails were a very prevalent big thing, and also in Michigan, you're absolutely right. So we are learning, and we, we should be able to learn best practices that are out there, and uh, signage is, is, is a good thing. So, uh, yeah, it's it's... No easy answers, as Mark said, but, but I think we can learn a lot from what other folks have gone through on these things. So I, I've lived in Bellingham for about 15 years. I used to live out in the county. Um, but one thing I've noticed is that uh, you know, the deer population just keeps growing and growing and growing. Because they have no natural habit, are no natural enemies uh, to deal with, you know, other than cars hitting them. Or so, you know, we have to, I think, manage that whole thing as far as because the numbers of number of the population of deer just keeps increasing, and actually, the habitat is decreasing because building is going on all over. So, that to me is a concern. I, just to take a second on that one, uh, that's true across North America. Uh, both whitetail populations, blacktail populations, you know, they're, they're going up. Uh, Six percent, and, and this is part of a bigger picture again, you can kind of follow this, this train of thought, but six percent of the country are hunters. That's, that's an average. Uh, it's, it's stable right now, because that's one control on population. I mean, that's a managed activity. It's that number of hunters across the U.S. is pretty stable right now, but that number shows that when you hit, when the population of the hunter hits 70, it drops off significantly. So a lot of that population stability in, in the hunter populations is because of baby, baby boomers, i.e., c'est moi. Uh, but when we hit 70, that's going to drop. And the recruitment into hunting is, isn't what it used to be. So the, we were the, a, a major predator of, of whitetail, blacktail, whatever. And as that diminishes, that problem's even going to be more compounding uh, as we go forward. Not to say that, that hunting is the only thing, but that is one, you know, one. And, but wolves, too. We have 120 in the state now, so. <laughs> yeah, and I'll just state real quickly. So other than natural, the predation stuff that I talked about earlier and other mortality factors, um, if you don't live in the urban area where there's not where there's no firearm restrictions, if you're on the periphery, if you're um, outside of the um, the city, basically, 
uh, there are tools that are, you have a wider swath of tools. So you have hunting as an option. There's such thing, something known as a damage prevention cooperative agreement, which is a permit basically after you've um, implemented non-lethal action and shown that, that that's ineffective um, on your property, then you could, in some cases, upon qualification, um, be issued a, a, a depredation permit under certain circumstances. But then we come in and we reassess the effectiveness. Did we cause, did we solve the problem with one animal losing or not being there or did we not? And we do that um, very methodically and through standard operating procedures. But there are options if you're on the periphery and not within the bounds of the city itself and there's no firearm restrictions or safety concerns, et cetera. Just on that hunting thing, when I was growing up in Michigan, you could take one buck uh, and to get a doe permit was very rare. Um, now, with, a, with black powder, archery, and a more liberal uh, rifle season, you can take five deer, and the population still goes up. So, I mean, not that, I don't know who you want five deer for, but, but you know, you could, and so it was. And, the, and then success rate, when I was young, used to be about 20%, and, and now it's like 80%, so. I just want to say I really appreciate what Bellingham has done to uh, prohibit feeding and everything, but I live two doors outside of Bellingham, and on my street, there's a number of people that actually feed. I mean, these are grained animals, uh, there, and there's deer all over the place, and I, I, I just don't know what, I, I guess, what can you do about something like that? You're, I'm in an urban area, and it's very highly dense, uh, you know, lots of people live there, and... Uh, uh, you know, so you, you've got Bellingham doing a good job on one side, then you've got people two doors out, they're just feeding like crazy, and there's lots of deer running around my neighborhood. You, the bucks just strut down the street, and, uh, and the, the does, I mean, they're all over the place. And uh, it's, it's rare that I don't see four or five a day, you know, when I leave. So I, I, I guess I don't know what the answer to that is, except in your neighborhood, maybe you should form some sort of an organization that would deter people from doing but I guess that's about the only thing we can do uh, that I know of but uh. it's private property and it's outside of a city limit you know there's uh, you know I let's talk to your neighbors but yeah there's not much else you can do I guess huh? is it an HOA type situation or no just a HOA is yeah are you like in a community like an HOA like with an HOA basically homeowners association uh no, I, I, I don't know that we are, <coughs> we have a homeowners association. I'm mean, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you don't have to pay fees and such. Okay. No, no, we don't do that. Have you, yeah, I'm just, it's like the same one that leaves trash around, you know, around the neighborhood or whatever. It's just try to talk to the people, but that they're, they're not doing it a favor to anything. Yeah, so that's, that's about all you can do, I guess, is just try yeah. to convince them somehow. Buy a hunting license. <laughs> I was going to say, how many acres do you have? Or do you have an acre or more? Or? Oh, I, I have a postage stamp land. I live on Lake Whatcom. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, just, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's dense right there. And uh, what is the neighborhood called, Bill? The... Geneva. It's Geneva area, yeah. So it's, uh, I mean, there's lots of houses in Geneva. You couldn't be shooting anybody or anything. <laughs> I mean, at minimum, we have lots of educational materials listed here. We've got the website, and you could at least point them in that direction, and hopefully people, I think a lot of people, when they understand that there might be significant downsides of what they're doing, they, they change their behavior. So. I'm wondering if, if it would be reasonable or possible for Department of Fish and Wildlife to work with Whatcom County and the same kind of initiative that we've taken with the city to kind of deal with urban wildlife as more holistic. It's, I mean, deer aren't gonna cross, I mean, they're not gonna pay attention to the signs, okay? Nature knows no boundaries. And so would it be reasonable um, for the city to work with the county and, and, the state, and the State Department of Fish and Wildlife to do some kind of a management plan? Because, you know, as, as our city's growing up and growing out, and then Ferndale's growing this way, and you know, it seems to me like if we're gonna do wildlife management, could we do it in a more holistic way by watershed or by, you know, by the county area? I don't, I don't know if that's been done anywhere in Washington State, but 
I have a question. Would it be possible to explore more of a kind of a countywide policy of you know deer management with education as kind of a goal um, to not feeding, getting proper signage on the streets and do it more, because we have city county within Lake Whatcom Watershed, for example, we have city county, you know, Harrington Road, you know, out to Lummi Res, out to Chuckanut, and where, you know, where you live, it's outside the city limits, but it's the same deer. So could we somehow possibly educate a wider area than the city boundaries? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to let Cole answer. No, nope, I'm not going to do like a policy this, one. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> I'm just like it. Yeah. Uh, the, can we explore those ideas? Sure, we can. The reality, as, as Cole mentioned, we're strapped. We're looking at a $30 million budget cut in the next biennium. Uh, we're, we've reduced officers in the field. We've reduced staff. Um, you know, we depend for a, a good chunk of our of our revenue uh, from licensed sales, fishing, crabbing, hunting sales, and also federal money, Pittman Robertson money, and all of that. Uh, a lot of states have a designated income stream that they don't have to go to the legislature every biennium with cup in hand. We don't. Um, there will be possibly uh, looking at a bit of a sales tax chunk, a very small bit, you know, a, a fraction of one cent to go to fund the Department of Fish and Wildlife. So we're not dependent on the whims of the legislature in each biennium. Because any of you in, in business know that it is very difficult to manage a business when you don't know what your revenue stream will be in an, after any given two-year period. So there's lots more that we need to do. We're just looking at the new killer whale initiative out, out here. The problems are growing. We're seeing our population grow, habitat destroyed, climate issues are becoming realer every, realer, more real every day. Uh, but we're, we're pushed to the limits right now on, on all these things, and, you know. And, and also with the, with the mood of polarization in the country, of, of the segment of the population that is just anti-government, <laughs> period, that, you know, wants to turn over public land to private uses. So I hear you, Wendy. And it's, it's very frustrating for us, too. So, so I'm kind of a habitat guy, and I think that habitat in the urban environment is one of the critical things. And I'd like to build on the issue that there needs to be as much interagency inter coordination on habitat issues in the urban environment, like the lady down there talked about in trying to get data on the basics like mortality. But I've been urging the city to do an urban forestry management plan, because right now we have stovepipe, whether it's public works or planning or parks and recreation, that look at things very narrowly. And if we put together a plan for the entire city to not favor early seral vegetation, or as you called it, low-lying vegetation, and try to manage for a more of an optimum urban forest environment, that I think you could at least do some things in a passive way to address you know some of the some of the problems. I live on the South Hill, and it, it, it's very frustrating in terms of interagency coordination to see deer limping around with broken legs. And you call and say, "Well, is it down?" And I said, "No, it's barely walking." Well, you, we can't do nothing until it's down, and that's really sad uh, because you know that animal's going to suffer. And, and so I think there's some things you can do on the mortality side and get the data and the information about where the, where the mortality is occurring and why, and then, then, then address it in habitat. And it doesn't need a state or federal response for that. This is local. Well, again, I, I will bring that information back, but I think there, there is 
efforts slowly. Uh, again, just like uh, with the, the state, there are so many things we are attempting to juggle and, and, and do at the same time that we don't have money to do anything as comprehensively as we might want to, but I, I do believe there's more work that's going into mapping habitats, and I think the connectivity issue is is really important. And also, as you're mentioning, if you can manage to reduce the amount of excess feed, that would actually reduce some of the concentration as well. So I'll, I'll make sure those uh, get um, sent to the, the right people that might be uh, looking at those things. You're absolutely right, though, sir. So a ridiculous suggestion. The city of Bellingham has got an ordinance against feeding deer, $250 fine, and yet you go into a feed store and you can buy deer feed within the city. Has there been any effort to approach owners of businesses that sell feed and say, hey, we'd like you to support this ordinance by not selling feed? In fact, why don't you put up a sign that, that indicates why it's detrimental to wildlife? That cannot be that big a segment of, the, of that business's revenues, I shouldn't think. I've got a neighbor who goes and buys a $20 bag of feed that's 50 pounds, and, and I, there was a herd, as I'm, I'm, I'm outside the city limits as well. There's a herd of deer as we're leaving to come to this thing. I mean, there's eight does walking down the road very staunchly. But I was just curious if, if there could be a, um, an approach to these businesses and say, hey, please help us support. What, what, what's the point of having the ordinance if you're just going to sell the stuff anyway? Just a question. I'll take a quick stab at that. Uh, that's, that makes sense to, to, to educate it in terms of at least having those owners let city residents know that they're not supposed to do this, but also just to present the general position of maybe they ought not to be doing that at all. Uh, but we do have this issue of, of people from the county come into the city to purchase things, and so they're flowing in and out, and then you have Canadians flowing in and out, and they're not under the same law, so it's, it's sometimes difficult to deal with commercial prohibition, but we might want to at least approach some of those businesses and see if they'd consider dropping those products or maybe putting some educational materials up that would at least have their customers be a little more discerning before they buy giant bags of things. So. You're right, though. <laughs> but the Is there a store height? sells cigarettes, too. <laughs> Is there a height restriction in Bellingham <laughs> for fencing? I've heard somebody, my neighbor who feeds deer, said, and a, a neighbor on the backside was put up a fence, and she threatened to sue the owner because it was higher than six feet. So, is there a height restriction without getting a special permit? Good question. I don't remember the number, but I think I think it is true that if you go over six feet, you maybe have to get a conditional use permit, or it's only under certain select circumstances. If it's like an interior fence, not around the perimeter, that might be be different. But um, so, and, and of course, that's a matter of balancing things that a lot of people don't like. 10-foot fences around houses all the way around a yard. And so there's, uh, that's something where the city is a little bit caught in between a couple sets of interests. But um, we'll see, I, I will take a look at that and see, for example, what, uh, what flexibility there is for interior fencing. I assume that that's uh, kind of a different issue if you're just fencing off a garden versus the perimeter fence. I think that's where those, those restrictions do come into play. And I think you need a, a special permit, so. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's good to hear these issues because we need to know what we need to learn more about to make sure we're being effective with this new ordinance. And I'll not recommend the netting. If you're going to, yeah, go, go spend a little bit more money and get the wire. It'll last longer and the deer will eat the netting sometimes or get tangled in it on their antlers and it can cause you more issues than you need. So I would go with the wire in most cases. <laughs> but um, I just would like to applaud the inclusion of raccoons. Um, and I'm a wildlife activist as well. I'm backyard wildlife mentor and variety of things. I can appreciate animals to no end. But but deer and raccoon have special places in the urban environment, and and particularly the raccoons. And I give you guys a quick anecdote of a neighbor. Um, kind of coinciding with the rental inspection issue in, in the city. 
um, a neighbor a street or two over from me was inspecting his rental house and <clears throat> apparently the tenants had never reported the fact that there were <coughs> numerous raccoons coming and going through an open crawl space into the house. And after he started paying good money for a private trapper to trap these things, um, he ended up with more than a dozen, seemed like it was up in the upper teens worth, of families of raccoons living under this house. And, and the amount of damage that those things will do to a structure, a living structure, is enormous. The damage they'll do to, to gardens, to garbage cans, and to your pets. In that time, I lost two pets, in fact, and another couple of neighbors I saw on the next door social network, they're posting, have you seen my missing cat? And I, I hated to post on there. I said, it's probably not just roaming around. It's probably gone, you know, and so anyway. So the raccoons, and they're really smart. I mean, they're really, really smart and, and bold. They'll come in through your cat door into your kitchen. I mean, they're, they're dangerous. So anyway, I appreciate the inclusion of raccoons. On it. I saw that John Candy movie. I know what they do. <laughs> so I, I love my animals, and I have chickens, and of course raccoons love my chickens, but I have a good way to keep my chickens safe. But um, if, I, if, if you catch a raccoon in a live trap, which you don't kill it, what do you do with it? <laughs> well, that, that depends. <laughs> so I'm not aware of the translocation rules regarding a raccoon. We hire wildlife control officers to do all of those things, and we usually those end up in lethal removals. There are, there is, um, circumstances where they do release it. But we, as I, myself, as a wildlife biologist, anytime you relocate an animal, it's not a very good situation. It doesn't end up the way you think it's gonna end up for the animal. It's, um, there's a, there's circumstances there that usually don't work out well. So most of the time, the ethical situation that most people face is to put it down rather than to relocate it. Um, however, if you catch one, um, it, it, I don't know what you. I don't know what the situation is. It depends on where you're at and what the situation is. So, have you caught one in your backyard? I guess with a. Oh, okay. Okay, and you're certain it's raccoons that are getting your chickens? Okay. Skunks get chickens. Too. Yeah, I was gonna say there's so many predators of chickens. Um, Be careful catching a skunk. Yeah, or a raccoon. Yeah, I, I would. I mean. Like I said, we have wildlife control officers that do it every, I mean, they're, they're professionals at that. Um, we can, in certain circumstances, if you had no other options, we could help you. But like I said, it's going to result in a lethal removal situation, so. I just have a question. Who, who do you call or what is the number to call for someone that you know is feeding deer if you want to report it? Within the city limits? Yes. I'm going to actually pull that up because um, I don't have it memorized. But and I'll speak to outside the city limits. Um, it's not illegal, so. Yeah. The, uh, the the numbers are are here, as as I mentioned. Uh, we're doing education and you know direct contact with people this year. We're not finding, but uh, the um, the code compliance officer number is there. We've got obviously our other uh, partners are listed as well. So another type of issue that we don't face right around here, I don't think. But at the commission meeting last week in Olympia, an issue that surfaces pretty regularly: small. Uh, private tree farms, tree farm owners, uh, girdling of, of their trees by black bear. That is a very real, I mean, Weyerhaeuser can, you know, the, the size of their farms are big enough that they can handle a 10 acres lost here, 15 acres lost there, but 
if, if you have a 60 acre tree farm uh, and you lose 10 acres because of black bear, so that, and again, it's the number of bears. So we can have special permit hunts to go in, but that's, um, the, that, that sort of damage is increasing. The number of bear, the bear population is going up. So since you uh, said you're thinking it's going to be about education and that's going to be for the first you know, year of it, so your response to somebody calling is going to be go, go and educate this person? Is that kind of the, the, with a warning kind of deal, like that kind of thing? And I guess the second piece of that is what are the next pieces of education beyond this session? Uh, this is what we have scheduled at the moment, so we'll have to see. We might have smaller uh, additional forums at, at neighborhood groups, um, but but indeed that's that's kind of what we're focusing on this year. It's it's a new ordinance. Um, you know, all, all our enforcement people are pretty busy, and and they're just starting to kind of pull this into their their work orbit. But we don't anticipate a massive workload, it's just a matter of that when the issue gets to that level, there needs to be some response. And so, for example, there was a gentleman who was causing some neighbor versus neighbor conflict in his neighborhood, and I know that our um, DFW folks and uh, our code enforcement folks did, did mention him and, uh, and mention the issue to him and, and got him to agree to, to stop feeding. At least um, that was the uh, story that I heard, but I wasn't directly involved with that. So. So um, that's where it stands now. So if we have, one has already reported um, someone feeding in the neighbor, neighbor, and they have been given the educational packet, which is step one, are you saying that through 218, there's not going, if you call, if it continues and you call a second time, there's no fine or uh, through 2018? Well, I think it's really, it's certainly authorized by the ordinance, but we're not going out of our way to make that the first course. If somebody, again, was an egregious uh, violator and was showing zero responsiveness, then that could, could happen. But we're not planning to run out and find a bunch of people. But I would say if you see a persistence of an issue, you continue to call and, and log those calls like it with, with any kind of nuisance or police-related matters, it, the numbers... Ma the, the numbers matter, and if people start seeing a pattern, um, it, it, it does generate response. And so, so again, it's, it, it's there as a, it's always a, a discretionary initially, but um, you know, I know that so cities that have these in place do start occasionally finding people, and I've heard that even that doesn't always work. So, um, but it, it certainly gets people's attention um, if, if they're not expecting it. So. But we're not start. We're not starting to that. We're not jumping to that right away. But it, it's certainly there, and it's in the ordinance, and it's it's um, it's part of the picture. Well, if we don't have any more questions, I might uh, just see if there's any concluding comments from our panelists, and then we can um, uh, call it a night. Um, but I really appreciate everybody coming and. Uh, we can talk informally if you have any additional things you want more in-depth follow-up on uh, after the meeting. But if our panelists have any uh, closing comments or thoughts or words of wisdom for us, uh, feel free. I just thank you all for attending. It's been nice hearing your comments and some of your concerns. And it'll be interesting to see where things go. And like I said, I'm here as a resource and my staff as well. So if you need us, um, just give us a call. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that. Your, your questions were all spot on, uh, but I think we all understand there's no easy answers to these, these types of questions. But, but you being here and, and having this now broadcast and on, it's a step in the right direction. So, yeah, work in progress like many others. Well, thanks for coming. Appreciate it.